From the Center for Investigative Reporting and PRX, this is Reveal. I'm Al Edson. When you get on a plane, there might be a federal air marshal sitting next to you. But some marshals are switching flights for personal reasons, treating their jobs like a mile-high version of OkCupid. Okay These air marshals are very frustrated because there's nothing happening. They're bored. So when given the chance, a sexual encounter, it's almost impossible to resist. Also, millions of Americans suffer from serious back injuries every year. Just heard a pop, pop, pop. I had to sit there five, 10 minutes before I can even straighten up. So Derek Moses got surgery, but her back didn't get better. And eventually she started to wonder if the screws used to fix her spine were fake, part of a nationwide scam. I had to know if I was part of it. I had to know. These stories and more coming up on Reveal. From the Center for Investigative Reporting and PRX, this is Reveal. I'm Al Edson. Trust. It's a really big word. We all take it seriously, especially when it comes to our personal relationships. But what about the trust we put in people whose job it is to protect us? Our doctors, government regulators, law enforcement. Today, we look at stories of people in power who violate that trust and the everyday people who have to deal with the aftermath. And we begin... 30,000 feet in the air. At this time, I'm going to ask that you fasten your seatbelts. For the last 20 years, I've been living out of a suitcase, and I am constantly doing the airport security shuffle. Security screening can be a hassle, but security doesn't have to be a stressful experience. But a lot of the time it is. Remove your shoes, take off your belt, take your laptop out of the bag, and on and on and on. The whole thing can be a serious hassle. And I can tell you firsthand, I was a flight attendant for about 10 years. After 9-11, the job went from fun and freewheeling to a serious, almost paranoid atmosphere. In those days, it was clear. The industry and the government had to make the public feel safe. And thus, the TSA and the airport security shuffle. At TSA, your safety is our priority. Part of that push to make us more secure in the sky is the Air Marshal Service. They're the armed undercover agents trained to stop terrorists. And since 9-11, the agency has grown from several dozen to several thousand. Along the way, there have been some problems. And now there's something new. Allegations that air marshals were pulled from their assigned flights not to go after terrorists, but to hook up for secret affairs or hang out in nice hotels. Seriously, sort of an OK Cupid and Travelocity rolled into one. This all came to light because of an epic Facebook chat between two women in a relationship with the same man. In December of 2013, Lisa Duran received some alarming Facebook messages from someone she'd never met. The person claimed to be the lover of Lisa's fiancé at the time, Roy Duran, and used the screen name Roy Duran's other e-girlfriend. And the messages turned graphic pretty fast. That's reveals Andrew Becker. The person said she was in a relationship with Roy Duran and sent naked photos of him as proof. It turns out the other e-girlfriend was Michelle D'Antonio. She and Roy both worked for the Federal Air Marshal Service. Roy was an air marshal and D'Antonio was a scheduler. D'Antonio had access to government databases that she could go in, look up his flight schedule, and allegedly tweak it as need be to get him closer to her. She worked uh, outside of Washington, D.C. Other rendezvous were in New York, Seattle, even Hawaii. And that's where the story moves from a love spat to an issue of national security. You see, after the air marshal ended the affair, he and his fiancée took the flight scheduler to court to get a restraining order. They also complained to the TSA. That caught the eye of federal investigators. They're looking into whether D'Antonio changed flights for other air marshals. That really opens up what has become something of a scandal with investigators trying to understand how widespread was this? How many times did this scheduler tweak or manipulate a schedule so guys could go to New York City or go to a baseball game or sometimes meet up with her? So if she's moving people around to go to places that are more desirable, does that mean that she is possibly moving people off of high-risk flights? The real concern, I think the real threat, is whether this scheduler was taking air marshals off of flights that may have been deemed high-risk or priority flights, cross-country flights with large fuel loads, 
investigators are trying to learn, trying to understand if security was put at risk because air marshals that should have been on those flights or had been assigned to those flights weren't on them. This sounds like a reality TV show gone bad. It's salacious and therefore it's attention grabbing. And no one would go on tape to talk about it. But the real problem here is deeper than just a love triangle. Mr. McLean, look forward to uh, hearing your story. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Lynch and Ranking Member Cummings. That's Robert McLean, an air marshal whistleblower testifying in front of Congress last year. I was in the first class of 35 air marshals to graduate after the 9-11 attacks of 01. McLean says he joined the air marshals to serve his country and fight terrorists. But his biggest battle was facing incompetent managers and arbitrary rules, like requiring male air marshals to wear military-style haircuts, suits, and ties. Kind of hard to foil the bad guys if everyone knows you're there to foil the bad guys. It became a joke. We would have children come up to us wanting our autograph or wanting to take a picture with us. We had big, jovial gentlemen that would uh, want to buy us a, a drink. I remember a nice lady shook my hand and thanked me for my service. It was very uncomfortable, and it made conducting our mission almost impossible. Then came what McLean calls the perfect storm. Officials issued a confidential memo warning that al-Qaeda was planning to hijack a long-distance flight. Air marshals were put on high alert, but at that very moment, the TSA ordered all agents to cancel any mission longer than three hours. The reason? The agency was running out of money and couldn't pay for hotel rooms. It made no sense whatsoever. So he complained to supervisors. He reached out to the inspector general's office. Not only the agency was in violation of the law, but he was clearly putting everybody in danger. No one responded. McLean leaked the story to a couple reporters, and the news exploded. Lawmakers stepped in. Travel restrictions on air marshals were lifted. But three years later, McLean was fired after the agency discovered he was the source of the leak. He fought back, taking his case all the way to the Supreme Court, and this January, he won. The justices ruled that McLean's firing violated the Federal Whistleblower Act. Now he's become a beacon for disgruntled agents. Uh, It's routine that I get phone calls from air marshals telling me that uh, a, uh, a manager, a supervisor, is using the flight scheduling to set up a rendezvous. And it wasn't just having sex, uh, sexual tryst, but it was also to go to a, to a golf tournament or to visit family or something else. The mentality at the Air Marshal Service is that uh, these Air Marshals are just filling seats. You know, they say, just get on the flight and do your mission. Clay Biles is a former Navy SEAL who spent five years as an air marshal and recently wrote a history of the service. He says mismanagement has led to the party atmosphere that we've been hearing about. Some agents even hire prostitutes when they're on assignment. They go out and they pick up prostitutes overseas. I mean, it's, it's a way to kill time. You, you might be uh, flying from uh, San Francisco to Hong Kong and then on your way to Vietnam and then back to Hong Kong and then off to San Francisco. That's a six-day trip. What are you going to do with all that per diem you get from the government? You're going to pick up women and, and have some fun while you're away from, uh, from the wife. We reached out to the Transportation Security Administration. They didn't want to talk to us, so we spoke to Kip Holly. He ran the TSA from 2005 to 2009. He says the current allegations are serious, but he questions whether this type of misbehavior could really affect flight safety. I can't believe that they would be able to impact the overall picture because the overall picture is scrutinized so carefully. That scrutiny includes monitoring flights that are considered high risk and regular briefings between the TSA and intelligence agencies. What's more, Holly says that while there have been some internal problems... The bulk of that organization is a very high-performing one, and I would not take the most effective, most flexible, best hardball capability that you have in the United States government to fight terrorists and uh, sacrifice it at the altar of somebody who's fooling with the flight schedules. Some lawmakers aren't convinced. Remember that love triangle between the air marshal and the flight scheduler? Well, prompted by our reporting, Congress is now investigating whether she diverted agents from high-risk missions. There are also questions about whether the service's $800 million budget is worth it. Reveals Andrew Becker says the challenge now is one of leadership. 
is the agency focused on its core mission, protecting flyers? The concern here for a number of air marshals is that um, the management is out to lunch. The way one former air marshal described it to us is that when the managers look in the mirror, no one's looking back. For more on Andrew Becker's investigation, check out our website, revealnews.org. This story was produced by Michael Montgomery. Now, a story about the power of a photograph. In our last episode, we explored the life of a troubled Army medic, a guy named Jonathan Melance. Melance served in a tank battalion in Iraq, and in our story, he talked about treating prisoners at a remote Army base after they were brutally interrogated and tortured. It was something the public knew nothing about. It's from my point of view, keeping a person alive while these so-called interrogation techniques are going on, it it definitely burns an image to your brain that you'll never forget. Melance gave medical aid to these prisoners, but he also took part in the abuse, and that left him deeply troubled after he came home. It's it's been really hard uh, over the years coming to terms with what actually happened over there. Melance died of a drug overdose six years ago, but he left behind an important piece of evidence, a snapshot. It shows John and an Army lieutenant smiling and posing with an Iraqi prisoner. Thing is, the prisoner isn't smiling. He's grimacing in pain. Our story caught the eye of the U.S. Army. After our broadcast, they opened an investigation into possible war crimes. Joining me to talk about these developments is our reporter, Joshua Phillips. He spent three years getting to know Jonathan Melance for a book about U.S. torture in Iraq and Afghanistan. So this photo we've got, we've got two soldiers here with a detainee who's clearly in distress. Why is this photo a big deal? Well, for one thing, this photograph shows what Jonathan Lance and other of his fellow soldiers had alleged, that they were involved in prisoner abuse and torture and that there were officers that were present. So this photograph shows Jonathan Lance and a lieutenant beside him. Uh, and in the foreground, there's a detainee who's sweating profusely and he's, his face is strained in pain as he's holding up this heavy wooden board. So how did the snapshot make it all the way from Iraq to the USA and then into your hands? Right. So these photographs are actually very rare. You know, since the Abu Ghraib prison abuse scandal of 2004, there really haven't been any publicly disclosed photographs that feature U.S. forces engaging in detainee abuse and torture. In Melance's case, he took his photographs and he sent them back home with letters to his friend, John Hutton. John Hutton basically kept the photographs and the letters for John in his home and ensured that no one saw them. So you actually sat down with John Hutton and he went through the letters with you. Let's let's hear some tape of that. Uh, We put sandbags over their heads and broke their thumbs by accident, of course. He was talking about how they burned them with cigarettes and waking them up all hours of the night. I mean, at the time, I'm, I'm sure everybody was doing it. And, you know, they were having a good time and messing around with these prisoners. But I think once he got back and got back into reality and just laying there at nights thinking about it or whatever, yeah, I think it got to him. So was that the only photo? John Lance told me that he took many other photographs of detainee abuse and torture. And his friends and family saw some of these pictures, and they even described them to me. Uh, Family members of his described pictures in which there were detainees that were chained to bars and hanging from bars. Um, There were soldiers that were pointing guns at detainees' heads in this very menacing way, things like that. But the family grew very distressed when they saw these photographs. They feared that it would force John to revisit wartime trauma, and so they threw them away. And so, as far as I know, this is the only photograph of his that uh, survived. Now, Josh, for several years now, you've taken this information to the military brass about what's going on. I mean, you even tracked down the officer in the photo, uh, Lieutenant Philip Blanchard. He's now a captain in the National Guard, but until recently, nothing happened. Yes. It really surprised me that after a dozen times contacting the military since 2008, inquiring if there had been any investigations into these allegations of detainee abuse and torture, they never got back to us with any information. It was only when we published this photograph that they seemed to take serious interest and then 
say they were going to take action. Okay, so now that there's an army investigation, what do you think will happen? I mean, how do you think this will turn out given other cases in the past? It's very unusual that they're reopening this case, and it's very hard to speculate about what might actually happen. In the case of the Abu Ghraib perpetrators, they served relatively longer sentences, but for the most part, most of the punishment for prisoner abuse and torture has been fairly light for military service members. Joshua Phillips, we will keep our eyes on these developments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Coming up later on Reveal, another story about veterans coming home from war and the impact one man had on their lives. I called him the candy man. Staffers say they knew what a VA doctor was up to, but no one was listening. I said that your own chief of psychiatry hands out narcotics like they're candy. And the director, like, sat back in his chair and, like, laughed. That's later this hour on Reveal. From the Center for Investigative Reporting and PRX, this is Reveal. I'm Al Edson. If you're about to have surgery, there are things you worry about. Going under the knife, chances of success, the painful recovery. And then there are things that you just don't even think to question, like surgical hardware, screws, the kind that get driven into the back and neck in spinal surgery. Reveal reporters Christina Jewett and Will Evans followed up on a tip that just seemed too weird to be true about a breakdown in a system that's supposed to make sure faulty medical products don't end up in people's bodies. I'll let them take it from here. So let's start with an 85-year-old machinist in his mom-and-pop shop in suburban Riverside County. It's near Los Angeles. I've made hammers. A lot of screwdrivers, different kind of screwdrivers. For a company that distributes hardware for spinal surgery. One day, someone from the company asked if he could make a more sensitive product. Screws. Meant to be driven into a person's spine. They gave me a sample, and they told me the size to make them, you know, the length and the thread diameter. Looked like a wood screw. But they weren't wood screws. These were carefully engineered to hold a human spine together. The Food and Drug Administration is supposed to keep a close eye on this stuff, or anything that goes into the human body. The companies that make them have to prove they're strong enough and made of the right metal. And that makes them expensive. Each screw can cost up to $300 or so. But the guys from the Spinal Hardware Company asked the machinists to make screws just like the government-approved ones, but for much less. He was trying to get me down to about $39 or something like that. He was trying to get them cheap. And that's where my reporting partner, Christina Jewett, picks up the story. Okay, now let's talk about a woman at the northern end of the same Southern California county, Riverside. Her name is Derricka Moses. Until about a year ago, she didn't know much about spinal screws. Derricka is a former softball star who's working for Pepsi, setting up displays in grocery stores. You know, you, you get some back pains, twisting everything, lifting a lot. So one day, Derricka is lifting a case of two-liter soda bottles. And just heard a pop, pop, pop. And so I just sat there for a minute like, oh, it'll go away. But this time, it didn't go away. I, I had to sit there five, ten minutes before I could even straighten up. She says the pain remained debilitating for days, then weeks and months. Constant, constant pain. She decided her only hope was something called spinal fusion surgery. The surgery uses special hardware to essentially build a bridge along the vertebrae. It's meant to take pressure off nerves in the spine. So she went for it. She found a doctor she trusted, went to the hospital with high hopes that her pain would end. She got four screws driven into her back. Six years later, this comes in the mail. A letter from a group of lawyers. Do you want to go ahead and read through it? You may have had fake spinal fixation hardware implanted in your body. And like I said, it's bold and that came across real hard on me. Three pages of something that I normally would have just thrown in the trash. I had to know if I was part of it. I had to know. The lawyers who sent that letter to Derricka They claimed that thousands of people had counterfeit screws lodged in their backs and necks. And if a patient has a counterfeit, there could be problems. If the threads aren't just right, the screws might back out of the bone. They might break. If they're not manufactured to FDA standards, they could even be toxic to patients. 
But for most of the patients, there's no easy way to find out which screws were implanted. They're embedded deep in people's spines, so the patients can't take a good look at them. We wanted to figure out what was going on. How could this happen in a system that's regulated by the government? Did Derica have fakes in her back? And how did they get there? Derica was lucky, if you can call it that. These spinal fusion surgeries are not always successful. For a lot of people, the pain doesn't go away. And that's what happened to Derica. So she had her screws taken out a while before she got that letter. She also convinced her nurse to give her the hardware after it was removed. I remember waking up and I looked over to my left and a nurse was there and she said, oh, I have your hardware right here. And she held up a bag and she said, all this came out of you. And she took it and she slid it up under my pillow. Of all things, Derricka wanted to melt down the pieces and make them into a necklace. Just to tell people, like, all this is something that used to be in my bag. And it was a representation of what I had been through. It would have been a great conversation piece. Then, when Derricka heard about the counterfeit scam, she locked them up in a safe deposit box at a local bank. We went to the bank to see them. Here's my life in a bag. Her life in a bag. Even I could tell some of the screws were not like the others. What jumps out to me is the logo. See, you're good. You're a lot better than I am, because I didn't even notice that until they pointed it out to me. They're not the same size. They're not the same. Look at these. I took pictures of the screws and brought them to the company whose name is on the logo. It's crazy. It's called the UNI Corporation. This is not what we design. That's the general manager, Sung Huan. The left one, very left one, is UNI, and uh, the other three is not UNI. And the first thing he noticed? The UNI logo on his screws is in italics. On some of these screws, the logo was straight up and down. Even on the same screw, the logo size is different. We leaf through a stack of photos of Derricka's hardware. So number two here, does anything jump out to you about, about that one? Uh, right one looks like somebody else. The left one looks like you and I. Look at that, that thread. So we design like this. The right one is not you and I. That's in, in a way, does it seem like they weren't even trying that hard to, to cover their tracks? Actually, I don't think they try to make the best product. Thank you. I went back to Riverside to see Derricka the next morning. Part two. I feel like a gumshoe running journey. around. The journey continues. Yep. Okay. I told her what the company manager said. He said, this one's authentic. Okay. Doesn't think those other three are, are the real deal. Wow. It's fake after all. They didn't even care enough to make it look right. So Derricka had some implants from a company cleared by the government and some unauthorized imposters mixed in. We started tracking down people who worked for the company that sold Derricka's screws to see how they pulled it off. The company is called Spinal Solutions. They're a distributor. They hire sales reps to bring their products to the doctors to get them to use their stuff. And the sales reps don't have to have any special license. You know, I would have thought I would have needed a lot more education or whatnot. We talked to one sales rep who would only speak to us if we disguised his voice. He was afraid his old bosses would come after him. At first, he told us he was thrilled to have the job. Of course, went home excited. I'm going to be in the medical field. I rule. Impress my kids. You know, doctors are awesome and they're highly educated. I'm going to roll with an educated class of people. The guy who ran Spinal Solutions is named Roger Williams. And it was clear to the sales rep that Roger was making a ton of money. He had a BMW, a Mercedes-Benz, and a yacht called a spare change. He and his wife flew around the country in a private jet, painted in purple and gold stripes, the colors of their favorite basketball team. And they would go follow the the Lakers around the United States. And sometimes they would, uh, of course, befriend a Laker or whatnot and fly one of them back as well. So the rep was pretty successful. He traveled around and actually went into the operating room during surgeries. He was there to answer doctors' questions about Spinal Solutions products. But then he also started to notice some weird things going on with the company's screws. The screws that I got out of trays that were going to hospitals were so bad, you couldn't ignore that they were counterfeit. It was so blatantly obvious to even the untrained eye. These screws are different. They have shavings on them still. They, they're not done. 
and they were going out in trays ready for sterile processing, and then they would go into the OR where they would be implanted into the patients. And the problem was, Spinal Solutions was selling spinal implants to doctors all over the country, in Nevada and Texas and Wisconsin. One of their regular customers was a prominent surgeon in Maryland, Dr. Randy Davis. He did hundreds of surgeries with Spinal Solutions implants, and he says he never saw any screws that looked wrong. I think most, most real spine surgeons would be able to tell if the screw was made by some little old guy in an instrument shop. I don't really believe that story. But there's more to the story about Dr. Randy Davis, and it helps explain how Spinal Solutions brought doctors on board. See, the doctor says the company sold him on the idea that together they would develop new products to help patients. The doctor had the ideas, and Roger Williams, the head of the company, was going to bring them to market. And I really believed him because he is such a good salesman. That's the one thing that Roger was great at. So you, when he was selling you in the beginning, you really believed it. You really believed that he was going to do great things. So Spinal Solutions signed up the doctor as a consultant, and the company paid him hundreds of thousands of dollars for his ideas. Now, Spinal Solutions might seem like some rogue company, but this part is pretty common for this industry. Medical technology companies hire doctors as consultants all the time, and sometimes these close relationships can cross a line. You use my expensive hardware, I'll pay you well. Prosecutors have cracked down on some deals, calling them kickbacks. So I asked Randy Davis if he thought Spinal Solutions was trying to buy his loyalty. That's something that I always ask myself every day that's very important to me that I ask myself to make certain that I ask myself. I didn't follow that. I ask myself that every day because I do not want to be in a situation where I am going to make any decisions on patients based on money. And I believe I do not do that. The relationship lasted several years. Eventually, the doctor says he cut ties with the firm because he didn't see the company doing enough with his ideas. Now, let's be clear. No one is suing Randy Davis for using counterfeits or taking kickbacks. But the lawyers allege that several other doctors were doing both. Right. So we don't know if surgeons got a good look at the screws in the operating room. We don't know whether they knew the screws were fake. But we do know Spinal Solutions took very good care of its doctors. We went out to a remote Southern California airport to meet a pilot who flew private planes for the company. Robert Garrison told us the company president had him ferrying doctors around and even making deliveries of cash. You know, he said these doctors are greedy. They're so greedy you can't believe it. All I do, he says, I take advantage of their greed. The pilot told us Roger asked him to make some unusual deliveries to doctors, bundles of $100 bills. And they said, get a nice box at the airport and put this, and it was full of money. I counted approximately $20,000 cash. Another time, Garrison says he made a special delivery to a Southern California doctor. The package was a bottle of wine with a little something more. Money in the top of it. There was money in the top of the wine bottle? Yeah, it was, it was a, a, you know, a canister with a wine bottle in it with a bunch of cash around the top of it. Now, passing doctors bundles of cash like that could be considered a bribe. We tried to find Roger Williams to get his side of the story. Emails, letters, phone calls. We contacted several lawyers he's used over the years. No word from Roger. We did get our hands on a recording of a bankruptcy hearing from 2013. Please raise your right hand. Do so nice where I tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Please state your full name. Roger Carl Williams. Okay. Roger had gone from bringing in $18 million a year in revenue at his peak to crushing debt. Bankruptcy officials tried to figure out where all that money went. Uh, Cancel ch- or the actual checks being deposited. Yeah, well, you know what? I 
sort of resent where you're going with this because the no, thing is, all this money was put in the company, that's fine. and that's the only on way it. we could survive. There's okay? no need for And I don't this. appreciate the fact that you are implying that I'm, you I'm know, not sir. implying anything, sir. You know, because I'm I really you know what's going on here, and I'm going to tell you something. I did everything to keep this business alive, everything possible. I got, a, I don't have a penny to my name. I got three thousand dollars in my account. Okay, sir. So you can dig to your heart's content, but you will not find a dime from me. There are a couple of problems at work here. For one, we have a system where medical firms can get pretty cozy with the doctors who use their products. Things like artificial hips and prescription drugs. When medical companies lavish money on doctors, it can end badly for patients. And we have this system where there's a lot of trust. Patients trust their doctors. Hospitals expect doctors to be ethical. And doctors expect medical hardware salespeople to be legit. The FDA doesn't monitor every screw sold to every doctor. So the system depends on the honesty of all these parties. Obviously, there was a breakdown here. And the sales rep we talked to would tell you that he begged the FDA to look into this. You need to go sirens blazing and door kicking and stop this like f-ing yesterday because every day that you guys don't do something, some loved one is getting these f-ing screws put in their spine. So. The longer you drag this out, the more victims there are, the more fraud there is, the more pain and suffering or possible uh, paralysis. I mean, you can go on and on. So the FDA did open an investigation, but then they let the company continue selling its products while they traded letters back and forth. The FDA wouldn't tell us anything except to say the investigation is ongoing. The FDA also recalled some of Spinal Solutions implants at one point. But what does that mean if the screws are already buried in your back? Any way you look at it, the FDA certainly seemed to alarm Roger Williams. During that bankruptcy hearing, he said he brought in paid consultants to help him deal with the feds. And if I didn't pay them, then I'm looking at criminal charges for, that's, for stuff. So, why, so, you know, I did what I could to find so money to wherever it was, if it was in my backyard or wherever it was, to so pay you, whatever I could right, pay. So you're covering yourself, so. and that's why we're, we're making So Spinal that. Solutions isn't selling screws anymore. And that elderly machinist who used to make screws for the company, he says he doesn't have any business these days. He said his doctor's been after him for 15 years to stop working, and he worries about getting dizzy and falling. But he doesn't worry about his handiwork on those screws he made. Now looking back, you would be okay with the ones you made being used in surgeries and ending up in people's backs? Yeah, sure. Okay. Why would I be worried? Derricka Moses finds ways to laugh about what's happened, even though her unsuccessful spinal surgery means she now needs a whole closet of devices to get around. She has a brace, a cane, and a walker. Kind of you see a lot of older folks wear or use with the wheels. The only difference of mine is I don't have the tennis balls yet. (laughs) She's given up on the plan to make a necklace out of her surgical hardware. I don't think it'll ever become jewelry. I think it's going to become an international exhibit maybe one day. Something, a reminder that he can't do this to people. She hopes that someday, someone will be held accountable. That was Reveal reporters Christina Jewett and Will Evans. That story was produced by Marianne McCune, with production help from Delaney Hall. As for former Spinal Solutions president Roger Williams, well, it seems he's already been looking into new ventures. The last time that Dr. Randy Davis heard from Roger, he was pitching a medical technology project in the South Pacific. Here's what he told Will. They they showed up in the middle of the night like about 10 Samoans. You're kidding me. No. He, he, Roger showed up in your... Roger showed up, like just said, I've got these... Got some people from the Samoan government. Would you be willing to talk to them? <laughs> it was the most bizarre thing I've ever heard. And then I didn't hear anything else. If you like this story, you should check out our website, revealnews.org. Our reporters are constantly investigating stories, like this one, on how people are building assault rifles from parts they buy on eBay. Yep, that's right, eBay. Check it out. That's revealnews.org. Stay with us. We'll be right back with a follow-up to our investigation on how the VA doles out painkillers to veterans. That story in a minute. From the Center for Investigative Reporting and PRX, this is Reveal. I'm Al Letson, and today we've been talking about trust and what happens when that trust breaks down. 
That's happened a lot in recent years between veterans and the agency that's supposed to take care of them, the Department of Veterans Affairs. Back in January, Reveal's Aaron Glantz broke a story on our website about a VA center in Toma, Wisconsin. The center had become notorious for overprescribing narcotics to veterans, often to treat PTSD and depression. That story prompted the VA to launch an investigation. And now a preliminary report confirms that doctors put patients at risk by prescribing heavy doses of opiates. And even when doctors saw warning signs in patients, they failed to change their medications. 35-year-old former Marine Jason Simkoski died of a drug overdose last August inside the hospital's psychiatric ward. But there have also been victims outside the hospital. Aaron Glantz picks up the story from there. Chile, Wisconsin is a small town of about 500 people. It's a rural area. And as the name suggests, it's bitterly cold this time of year. The snow is piled high, and off a small county road, there's the farmhouse of William and Elizabeth Miller. Inside his workshop, William is building custom furniture. The Millers are Amish. That means there are no electric lights, and William is using a diesel generator to power his tools. Hi there. I didn't need to start all you. Sorry. That's fine, that's fine. Hi, my name is Aaron Glantz. I'm a journalist. I work for the Center for Investigative Reporting. And, I give uh, William a chance to catch his breath, and when he's settled, I ask him about a day five years ago. His family was riding their buggy down the road, and a 1997 Dodge Caravan hit them from behind. We've been using our horse and buggies all our life. We were driving down a street that we'd driven down many times before, and all at once... Things change forever. William and his nine-year-old son weren't hurt, but his wife and baby, Adam A., were thrown out of the buggy. Paramedics found the baby face down in the grass. She wasn't breathing. They took her to the hospital and she was on life support and we were at her side when she passed away. And that was like within two hours of the accident. She was just six weeks old. The driver of the van was Brian Whitkiss, a former Marine. He was doped up on painkillers and huffing paint at the time of the accident. I was taking uh, hydrocodone, uh, Tylenol 4s, and Klonopin. Whitkiss is 56, but looks a lot older. He has a ragged gray beard and walks with a cane because of the shrapnel that's still lodged in his back from his time in Beirut. Like many veterans in the area, he was getting narcotics from the VA hospital in Toma. He pled guilty to vehicular homicide and served three years in jail. Now he's living in a halfway house about an hour north of the Miller's family farm. All these years later, he still says the drugs didn't affect his driving. My uh, tolerant level was higher than uh, what it was for a regular person that just come on it because I've been on it for over 20 years, and that's why my tolerance level was a lot higher. I went to the courthouse and looked through the files on this case. One document surprised me. It showed that Whitkiss was so hooked on painkillers, he would hurt himself on purpose just to get more. But Whitkiss says it had nothing to do with the drugs. He says he wasn't watching the road that day because he was thinking about his wife, who had died two months earlier from breast cancer. He says he had car problems. I was having some issues with the uh, van, mechanical, electronical issues. So I got a can of this uh, computer cleaner. I was spraying it up in in there, and I must have inhaled the fumes. And it just felt really weird doing that. I could see my wife. You know, I could see Rita in my peripheral vision. I said, wow, is that what this does? And as we said, Whitkiss was getting his drugs from the VA hospital in Toma, where there have been a lot of problems linked to narcotics. Monica County Dispatch. Hi, this is Daryl calling from the Toma VA. Um, would it be possible to speak to the coroner? This is Dexter calling from the Toma VA. Mm-hmm. I need the coroner to this be Hi, hey, this is Daryl calling from the Toma VA. I have a veteran that passed away, and I need to notify the coroner. These are 911 calls coming from inside the VA hospital. I thought there might be a couple of them, 
But when we asked the local police department for its records, it turned out there had been more than 2,000 over the last five years. And 24 of those calls were to report a suspicious death where someone working at the VA was calling the coroner. The La Crosse Tribune helped us comb through local police records to figure that out. So victims connected to this VA hospital are starting to stack up. There are all these 911 calls, the Miller's baby girl, and a former Marine who died from an overdose in the psychiatric ward. There's also a 23-year-old woman who died after she snorted about 200 oxycodone pills. They were meant for her boyfriend, an Iraq War veteran, who got them from the Toma VA. Sometimes I'd have veterans sitting there that would be literally falling asleep. Uh, Some would be uh, maybe awake, but clearly not there. They were just in their own zone. Um, That's Glenn Mosley. He's a Gulf War veteran who runs peer support groups at the hospital. Like many of his colleagues, Mosley said he's worried about the vets. But he's also worried about the people around them who can also get hurt. I was talking with a veteran today who's in our program, and I remembered that she had had a couple of car accidents. So then I got to thinking about that. So I said, refresh my memory. When, when was that? She had wrecked her truck. She drove it into the ditch and totaled it in December. In February, she totaled her other car. This is all on her way here, coming here. But she was so medged up, she wrecked that car. She crashed her car twice coming to the VA? Yes. That sort of thing happens a lot. We interviewed dozens of employees who've been complaining about out-of-control opiate prescriptions for years. They provided emails and other documents proving they brought their concerns to their congressmen and senators. They went to the VA inspector general, filed federal whistleblower complaints, and even contacted the DEA. They exchanged emails directly with VA Secretary Bob McDonald. But nothing seemed to change. Inside his cramped duplex, Jason Bishop is cooking mac and cheese for his nine-year-old daughter. He's an Air Force veteran and has lots of health problems, both physical and mental. But he says all he can get from the VA is pills. Every time I went in there, I would get asked, do you need more? Do you need more? And I would say, no, I don't need more. I don't want more. Find something that works and fix the problem. You know, if I had it the way that I wanted it, then I'd be getting acupuncture, you know. I'd be doing yoga. I'd be doing empowerment stuff instead of, you know, killing myself with this Mm -hmm. Because that's honestly what it feels like it's doing. It's ripping a hole in my stomach. In his bedroom, he opens a drawer tucked under his mattress where his daughter won't see it. There are dozens um, of half-full bottles of morphine and other powerful drugs that he got from the VA. Is this the morphine right here? That's the SR, yeah. It's an almost full bottle. And then there's another full bottle of morphine around here somewhere too, right? This is the immediate release. Yeah, so you had these two bottles of morphine that are they gave you. You're supposed to be taking both of them basically round the clock. Right. On top of the morphine, the Toma VA gave Bishop prescriptions for a cocktail of other drugs. Downers, like tranquilizers, and uppers, these two different kinds of Ritalin, which are amphetamines, plus antidepressants. That combination of drugs violates the VA's own policies for treating people with PTSD. We asked Dr. Andrew Kolodny to take a look at Jason Bishop's medical records. Kolodny is chief medical officer of Phoenix House, a national network of drug treatment programs. He says the drug cocktail was dangerous and could even be deadly. When patients are prescribed opioid pain medications in combination with other drugs that slow down the breathing, it's not simply one plus one equals two in terms of decreased breathing. It's a synergistic effect. It's more like one plus one equals three. So if it's so dangerous, why wasn't anyone keeping a closer eye on the VA? And who's responsible for prescribing all these drugs? Candyman. I called him the Candyman. That's what Janelle Arnold, a psychiatric nursing assistant at the VA, called her boss, Dr. David Houlihan. He's the doctor who was treating Brian Whitkiss when he drove into the Miller's buggy. He's the same doctor who prescribed that powerful cocktail of drugs to Jason Bishop, the veteran with the drawer full of morphine, 
and under Houlihan's watch as chief of staff, the number of oxycodone pills prescribed at the Toma VA went up by more than 1,000 percent in eight years. Hello. Hi, Dr. Houlihan. It's Aaron Glantz from the Center for Investigative Reporting. How are you? I'm fine. What do you want? When I reached Houlihan, he wasn't in the mood to talk. He's been under investigation since January, when we first started to report on the problems in Toma. I've not, I've not been allowed to comment. There's an investigation. Thank you. Houlihan is still getting paid during the internal investigation but he's been barred from treating patients or prescribing drugs. He says he hasn't done anything wrong. So I asked his boss, Mario DeSantis, what he knew about veterans dying of overdoses at the hospital. I can't really speak to that, but what I can... You're the hospital director. You should know. If people are dying in your hospital of overdoses, you should know how many there are. Uh, Again, those are things that, again, we're going to be... We would look at and investigate if uh, there are... Uh, allegations or there is, uh, again, the signs of not meeting the standard of care. We're going to look into those things. Had you heard personally the phrase Candyland and Candyman before our story came out? I had not. I said, we have a bad reputation here. That's Janelle Arnold again, the nursing assistant who worked for Houlihan. I said that your own um, chief of psychiatry hands out narcotics like they're candy. I said, I know I've had people come to me and say that they can get narcotics from him. And the director, like, sat back in his chair and, like, laughed. So I asked DeSantis if anyone ever complained about it. You had nobody had ever called the Toma VA a candy candy land in your presence? Not to my knowledge, no. So nobody ever raised these concerns directly with you? They had not. But we have opportunities and mechanisms for folks to raise issues, and certainly if veterans or staff have issues or concerns, we want to hear about them. We want to address them. The hearing will come to order. There have been a series of hearings on Capitol Hill since we first started reporting on this. In February, VA Secretary Bob McDonald testified before the House Committee on Veterans Affairs He said everything was under control. We use a lot of alternative approaches, alternative medicines. We use acupuncture. We use yoga. We've used electronic devices that have been shown to be effective amongst some of our our veterans. Well, I mean, that that sounds great, Mr. Secretary, but I think if you look at the numbers of people who are on the alternate treatment versus the opioids, you you would find that there's a lot of people on opioids compared to the number of people that are getting alternate therapies. That's Republican Dan Beneshek of Michigan. He chairs a House subcommittee that oversees VA health care. Apparently the situation in Toma sort of contradicts what what you're saying here today, and I just want to be sure that we maintain a high vigilance on this problem. As for Brian Whitkiss, the man responsible for the death of six-week-old Adam A. Miller, he's no longer allowed to take tranquilizers as a condition of his parole. And his prescriptions for painkillers have been cut in half. He still has nothing but nice things to say about his old doctor, David Houlihan. He was pretty understanding on what was going on, you know, about my disability and everything. He, he really didn't push the meds on me. I, th- I think he's, he's an awesome doctor. Wickes wrote a letter to the family and the court while he was in prison and said he was sorry. But during our 45-minute conversation, he never once expressed any regrets about what happened to the Miller's baby. I had a psychiatrist when I was in prison over in Jackson County. And she asked me, she says, uh, with all your bad things that happened to you, What would you change in your life? I said, ma'am, I would not change a thing. Okay, that's the carriage that we used. Back on the Amish farm, the Miller's buggy has been fixed up. They still use it every day. Until I arrived at his house, William Miller didn't know that the man responsible for his daughter's death was getting his drugs from the VA. He was taking large amounts of narcotic painkillers. These are powerful drugs to help people deal with pain that are similar to heroin. 
and he was getting them from the Department of Veterans Affairs because he was a military veteran, mm -hmm. and that those medications played a role uh, in impairing his judgment. Is that what caused the accident? What it says in the documentation that we've reviewed is that he was being prescribed these medications. Yes. They affect your reflexes. Yes. They affect your thinking and your ability to focus. And he was being prescribed a lot of them, and he was taking even more than were prescribed. Well, that's something that I was completely unaware of, you know. Now, just in a general sort of thing, abusing narcotics is wrong. I don't care who you are. Abusing narcotics is wrong. If he was doing it, that was a factor in the accident. That's why he was uh, convicted in court. I have no comment on that whatsoever. He says he and his family have forgiven Brian Whitkiss. We believe in allowing God control of our life. Why he allowed this to happen is something that we won't know till the other side. The only thing for us to do is accept and move on. It doesn't do anybody any good to hate him. That story was from Reveal's Aaron Glance. As you heard in that report, many vets are struggling to find ways to deal with PTSD and long-term pain without using prescription drugs. If you're a vet who's found an alternative to painkillers, we want to hear from you. Text PAIN to 877-877, and we'll share your stories on the podcast. If you want to talk to us about that story or anything else on the show, you can always reach us on Facebook or Twitter or visit our website, revealnews.org. Our executive producer is Kevin Sullivan, and Suzanne Reber is our executive editor. Our editorial director is Robert Saladay, and our managing director is Krista Scharfenberg. Producers Julia B. Chan, Delaney Hall, Marianne McCune, and Michael Montgomery worked on this episode. Our lead sound designer is Jim Briggs, a.k.a. Jay Breezy. Our theme music is by Ezekiel Honig. You can listen to his music at EzekielHonig.com. Support for Reveal is provided by the Riva and David Logan Foundation and the Ford Foundation. Reveal is a co-production of the Center for Investigative Reporting and PRX. I'm Al Edson, and remember, there is always more to the story.